file in. Um, give it a few minutes before we get started here. So excited to see everybody coming in. Oh, goodness. We have a timely bunch tonight. No stress. Yeah. Well, well, if, if they're late, we'll put them on the baseline and run sprints. Oh, man. Like, like the stock market. We just hope they don't, the numbers start don't going down when we start talking. That's all. <laughs> it is. It is. The best part and the worst part of virtual events is you can leave when you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't leave practice until it's over, though, can you, Matt? Yeah. It's true. Not math practice. <laughs> no, you, 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 you might get thrown out of practice. <laughs> yeah. OK. Well, I'll just let people continue to come in as they need to, but we'll go ahead and get started. So. Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Megan Anderson. I'm the events coordinator at Park Road Books. We're so happy to have you here for this Matt Doherty event. Um, we're really excited to learn more about Rebound from Pain to Passion. Um, the panelists this evening will have a conversation and go back and forth and there'll be a reading about it. If you have questions along the way, please submit them in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also put them in the chat if that's easy for you, but the Q&A is the official way to submit questions and we will get to those at the end. Maybe your question or comment will be asked. Um, a note on the Rebound books. We have a bunch of them at Park Road Books, um, specifically many of which you guys ordered. Matt is coming in later this week to sign them. So if you we have, are holding them for that reason because we assume many of you wanted a signed copy. Um, if you want yours unsigned, you can come earlier. If not, we'll give you a call towards the end of the week, probably around Saturday to let you know that it is ready, signed to go. Um, lastly, I have to remind you that Park Road Books has a zero tolerance policy in regards to harassment. So by attending this virtual event, you agree to the code of conduct um, saying that you will not harass anyone, a panelist, an employee, attendee, no matter what. If you violate that, then you will be automatically expelled from this event and future events. Um, I don't think we'll have any problems. We never have. We're always a friendly bunch over here at Park Road Books. I'm a little disappointed, uh, <laughs> Megan. I'm not sure I'm going to be comfortable with that. I, I don't. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not used to being in environments where people don't harass you. You know, like Cameron Indoor Stadium and 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 over at NC State and Raleigh. I'm used to harassment. So this is a this is an interesting take. You know, I tried to come up with some sort of lingo around people getting like thrown out of games, but I didn't have the basketball terminology. Yeah, so. don't, don't, don't worry, I'll harass him before it's over with. <laughs> um, that being said, I will introduce our author and host, um, Matt Dory, as you know, played basketball at University of North Carolina. He starred, started <clears throat> on the 1982 national championship team with the NBA greats, Michael Jordan and James Worthy. The program was led by legendary coach Dean Smith. After one year as head coach at Notre Dame, Matt took over UNC, took over the UNC program and led them to the 2001 regular season ACC championship while being named AP National Coach of the Year. Since this, his time at UNC, Coach Doherty worked as head coach at FAU and SMU in addition to working at ESPN, the Indiana Pacers, and the Athletic 10 Conference. He currently runs the Doherty Coaching Practice, which includes executive coaching, seminars, and corporate talks. He continues to work in the media with weekly radio shows and the ACC Network, where he is a color analyst for basketball games. I definitely looked up what that was today. <laughs> Matt is married to Kelly and has two children, Tucker and Hattie. They reside in Mooresville, North Carolina. So we'll, we'll claim him as this is his hometown bookstore. <laughs> um, our host. Landis Wade is a recovering trial lawyer, dog and sports lover, host of the Charlotte Readers podcast, speaker, teacher, moderator, fly fisherman, and the author of the Christmas Courtroom Trilogy, whose third book in the series, The Christmas Redemption, won the holiday category of the 12th annual National Indie Excellence Awards. 
We are very lucky to sponsor the podcast and we love it. And we hope that this inspires you to listen to episodes if you have not. And we are very lucky to carry Landis's book as well. Um, I just want to remind everyone that Rebound copies signed and personalized are available at Park Road Books. You can order them all the ways you can call. You can do it online. You can come in the store with a mask, of course. Um, we do ship. We offer curbside. Um, and like I said, they'll be signed later in the week, so you still have time. So let's enjoy this conversation. And again, remember, if you have any questions or comments you want them to attend to at the end of this conversation, please submit them at the Q&A in the bottom of your screen. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Megan, for that great introduction. Um, first of all, Matt, uh, congratulations on the book. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Megan, for setting this this forum up for this opportunity for me, um, this rookie author. And Landis, thank you for your willingness to host. Um, it's a, This is the official, to me, the official launch. And uh, thank you to Park Road's uh, books, Park Road books. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's great. And so, uh, Matt, let's start with the title here, Rebound from Pain to Passion, Leadership Lessons Learned. I love this title. It's, it's, it's the perfect title, I think. Uh, lots of images come to my mind when I think of, when I hear the word rebound, both physical and spiritual. It could literally be a metaphor for your life journey, this, uh, this word of rebound. Tell us how that title speaks to you. Well, um, I want it to be uh, analogous to basketball um, and then rebounding from failure uh, because that's what, I've tried to do after being forced to resign at the University of North Carolina in 2003. Um, and I think that most people uh, have to rebound from something, some setback in their life, um, uh, whether it be big or small, um, that you know they could relate to that. And then the pain to passion part of it, Landis, the pain of losing my job in a public manner where my leadership was questioned to then going on a leadership journey and leadership becoming my passion. So that's the tie in uh, with the title. Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk about uh, the subtitle throughout the episode today, uh, uh, the pain, the passion and some of the leadership. But, uh, but before we get there, uh, we got some sports fans that have shown up, uh, that can be kind of impatient, Matt. So we'll probably just jump right into some basketball here for a second. <laughs> you know, they, yeah. they, they may or may not hang around for the esoteric part of the conversation here. We'll, we'll just get jump right into the basketball here. So let's start with some thrills from your perspective. What was your greatest thrill as a college player? I'm going to knock off a few. Was it playing for legendary coach Dean Smith, playing with Michael Jordan, winning a national championship, proving that Dean Smith was wrong when he said to you and your parents on a recruiting trip, you would be lucky to start as a junior, which you talk about in the book, or yeah. just plain beating Duke. You know, what talk could it be any or all of the above, or or maybe you've got another. I, I think I think you hit the main <laughs> one. Uh, I think, um, and I saw my sister Nan, who uh, is is logged on. Um, all of those were special, and, and then I would add to it playing in Madison Square Garden in front of family. Um, you know, growing up on Long Island. I'm getting goosebumps as I talk uh, to play in Madison Square Garden uh, in that arena, uh, family in the stands um, winning. Um, the announcer, I think it was John Condon, and just hearing his voice being announced as a starter, uh, you know, that was that was certainly up there with the other the other games, the other events you mentioned. You know, I went through that list kind of quickly. I want to circle back and just have you hit on a couple of things there. I am, I was intrigued when I read that comment uh, in the book that Dean Smith said, you know, you would only start uh, possibly as a junior and you, you can tell the audience what your response to he, him was. Landis, he didn't say start. He says, you'd be <laughs> lucky. And I'll set the stage here. Yeah. You know, every, every coach coming in is, is intimating, you know, you're going to play a lot as a freshman they're selling their schools. And here comes coach Smith and he's the most relaxed, kind of leaning back, legs crossed. 
<laughs> and the topic of playing time comes up and I'm sitting across from him. And he said, uh, you know, in his typical nasally voice, <laughs> eh, uh, Matthew, you'd be lucky to play by the time you're a junior. And I remember leaning up and saying to myself, because I was not going to be disrespectful. My parents raised me better than that. And uh, I said to myself, I'll show you. And I think a couple things. One, he wants to stoke your competitive fire to see how you respond to that. If you're afraid of that, he doesn't want you. But also out of respect to you, the team, team players there, he's not going to promise anything to a young man when he has players who are already invested in the program who are already in the program he's not going he's, he's going to show them loyalty heck he didn't even put michael jordan on the front cover of sports <laughs> illustrated um as a freshman yeah I, I remember that you got a picture of that in the book it's it's interesting i guess you're still holding that over him that you got on the cover and he didn't um but, but let's yeah. talk about thrills as a coach for a second uh, uh both at notre dame and unc what would you pick out i mean there's Lots of lots of things you could point to, but are there one or two that stand out for you as thrills uh, uh, coaching at uh, e either Notre Dame or UNC or both? Yeah, well, both. But um, the first one comes to mind, uh, and and my former point guard at Notre Dame's on the call, Jimmy Dillon in Philadelphia, uh, one of the best leaders I've ever been around, and I'm really touched that he's on this call, and he wrote a nice endorsement in the book. Uh, Landis, we, we, you know, Notre Dame hadn't won a lot. Um, and we went into, after losing an exhibition game by 24 points to the same team that Ohio state beat by 24 or five points, we're scheduled to play Ohio state at Ohio state, like five days later, six days later, and they're ranked fifth in the country coming off of final four. And <laughs> we ran, uh, I, I ran the team uh, to get their attention. And uh, they didn't like me, I didn't like them. It was kind of this, like the scene from Miracle on Ice where uh, Kurt Russell, uh, after an exhibition game, uh, blows his whistle and makes the players skate into the night until they get nauseous and start saying that, you know, we play for the USA. And so I did that with our team. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of small talk between us. And then we go into Ohio State on ESPN. My first game as a head coach, the autograph ball, the team ball is right there in my office. And we beat them on a last second shot by two points. And again, I'm getting goosebumps. Uh, Jimmy Dillon led us with great players and Troy Murphy and Matt Carroll both went on to the N NBA. David Graves hit a huge jump shot. Uh, Harold Swanigan set the pick. That was huge. That was huge for me, for the team, for the program. And uh, that may have been the most significant win I've ever been a part of. Yeah, as a player or coach it has a huge a hoosiers feel to it and uh what what does it matter about all us old, old uh, athletes and we can remember everything that happened in a game you know 30 years ago i mean you know you you did a play-by-play -play yeah then, you know yeah but we can't remember to get a half gallon of milk at the at the, <laughs> at the gas station on our that's way right. home that's right you know? all right all right well shift to shift to carolina for a minute a, a biggest thrill as a coach uh coaching the tar heels well i think you, you know it's hard to you know, the first game at Duke, um, they hadn't won at Duke in five years. And uh, I told the team, you know, we're not going to, after we beat them, we're not celebrating. We're, 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 we're going to act like we've been there before, ex like, act like we expected to beat them. And we went over and Brendan Haywood hit two foul shots with one second to go to win by two. And... Um, we went over, shook their hands, and then danced around like little kids in a locker room. Uh, that that I wish the bus ride was a little longer than than eight miles. 
uh, from from Durham to Chapel Hill, because you want to enjoy that one a little bit longer than than the 20 minutes you're in the bus. But that certainly was a magical win uh, amongst some other wins we had. Now that that wasn't the game you're trying to fire the guys up by talking about how attractive the Duke cheerleaders were, uh, was it? <laughs> no, no, actually it was. It you, was. You're right. It was. You're you're right. <laughs> Okay, well, don't, that, get, that, don't get me in trouble. I'm not going to get you in trouble. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take you to another thrill, but uh, it's not a thrill that you remember. I, I'm a I'm a Davison guy, and in uh, in your second year uh, there, I believe it was, um, Bob Killip was my coach at Davidson. This is a complicated thing for you because, you know, you were an assistant coach under him. You played for him in high school at Holy Trinity. It was his handwriting on the roster that told you you were uh, actually made the varsity as a freshman yeah uh, and yet uh you know davidson comes into the dean dome and beats uh, your team uh there and uh you reflect on that loss in the book and of course what it meant to davidson was one thing but uh you know mckillop was kind of a mentor of yours and i'm just curious uh what do you say to you about that and how did he how did he mentor you you know after that because that's that was kind of a probably a complicated thing. For, I mean, I'm sure you're happy for him, but obviously extremely disappointed about the loss. Well, Bob Bob's more than a mentor for me. Uh, he was my high school coach, uh, someone I looked up to. Uh, I worked with when he first got to Davidson, and now I consider him a a, a great friend, uh, like a brother. Uh, albeit he's older than me, so I want to you know older brother, uh, much older brother if he's if any of his, you know, family or friends are watching. Um, but he, you know, I think the, the, the classy, the classy ones have compassion. And, and Bob knew, you know, like, you know, there's not great joy in beating, you know, you're happy for your players, but you also have feelings towards the other coach and knowing that, that's tough. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough on Matt. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that I beat him and he'll call me Matthew, that I beat his team in Chapel Hill, uh, that's going to be tough on him. Um, and, and I understand that, you know, he understood it. That's the compassion uh, of a classy leader. And um, so, yeah, but, you know, listen, I understood that second year we were going to have a down year. Um, uh, and you know, if I'm going to lose to anybody, I'd rather lose to Bob McKillop. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right. Well, so up until that year, um, you know, when, when Davidson beat Carolina, I have to throw that in again, uh, and the year that followed, you were kind of on the rise. I mean, you, you described this in chapter one, love of the game. Um, you learned to play basketball at the park. It's where you say in the book, you learn to compete. You learn to be tough. You learned, uh, you know, you were only good as your last game. You learn to dream. And I, I just, I'm curious about what those early days of competition, those sandlot pickup games, how that prepared you for your success on and off the court later in life, but also your failure on and off the court later. Yeah. On. Well, I think I've already, I started working on another book before I started this book. It was called The Park. And I'll, I'll probably finish that hopefully in the next year. And it's the lessons learned in the park. And Bob McKillop and I talk about it all the time. Uh, growing up, I'm from East Meadow. There was a park there called Prospect Park. In the book, there's a picture of the gates, and I call it the gates to heaven. And um, my sister Nan gets credited with taking that picture. Um, that was heaven for me because I, I, I love going there. I love the game of basketball. I wanted to, you know, as I got to the gates there, I was wondering, what, could I hear any balls dribbling? Um, uh, you know, could, could I, you know, who was going to be there? What was the game going to be like? Would I get in the first game? You know, the games in the evening were the better games at six o'clock. The college players would be there. Some guys from the ABA, the New York Nets played in the next town over in Uniondale. I mean, guys like Dr. J would show up at this park. It was big time. And, um, you know, the, the, just the, the ethos of the park, uh, you know, it had a, it, it was a living, breathing thing. And the cultural dynamic to it 
mainly middle class, some lower, some, you know, upper. Uh, call your own fouls. Don't take any crap. If people come from another park and they want to challenge us, okay, let, we got to step it up. Um, you know, you learn how to compete. You learn how to negotiate. You learn how to win. You learn how to take instruction. You learn how to give instruction. And I think those are the things that we miss in youth basketball today and in some of the youth because so many of the sporting events are organized for them that they don't go through the struggles of organizing themselves. And when there's a dispute on the court, how is it settled? Yeah. Sometimes it gets physical. Sometimes it doesn't. That's where the negotiation comes into play. And I think those are all lessons learned that I think help people become adaptable and resourceful as they get older in life. You know, well, you mentioned struggles and, you know, this book talks a lot about your struggles. It's a very honest account. You, you use the term uh, mining for the truth. And that's one of the things that uh, memoirs do. I've interviewed a number of memoirists on Charlotte Reader's podcast. Uh, that's the challenge in memoirs, finding the truth. Sometimes people say you find it when you write it down. And maybe you found some truths when you started writing here. But uh, you suffered two significant uh, heartbreaking experiences involving the game of basketball that you talk about in, in the book. And we're going to cover two of them, um, both of them. That is, for, the first one has to do with the end of your career as a, as a player because you started off in the park, as you said. You made the team uh, as a freshman. Bob Killip wrote the, your name on the, on the roster there. You, you played competitively in college, uh, did very well. And, that, and on the podcast, we have authors read a little bit from their book to kind of give a flavor for it. And we picked out this reading for you to do that, that speaks to this question of what happens uh, to a very successful basketball player when you come to the end of the road. So yeah. any, anything you want to do to set this up? I think you're yeah, kind well, of, yeah. you know, I was blessed, uh, as you touched on, I was always the best, you know, one of the best players on my team from fourth grade on uh, high school. I played varsity as a freshman. You allude to nobody ever played varsity as a freshman at my high school for Bob McKillop. We had great teams. We won state championships. I was a McDonald's all American. I started three years at North Carolina. I was a six man as a freshman. You know, when I was in fourth grade, I, I dreamt, I talked about dreaming and, and Bob McKillop was big on dreaming. And when you have a ball in the park, you dream about playing at the highest level. And that meant in the NBA. I was in love with the game. Like I had a relation, like, a, like someone has a relationship with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Hmm. It started at in fourth grade. So what are you in fourth grade, 10? And 13 years later, that love of mine told me she didn't need me anymore yeah so you, like. so you're, you're out of college you, you're you're actually going through the draft process you've gone to the you've played in i think something called the portsmouth yep. invitational tournament and uh, you're going to pick it up right there with that yep. Reading. yep so the uh after struggling in the portsmouth invitational tournament i attended the chicago pre-draft camp the athleticism was elite as there were better players than at the Portsmouth Invitational Tournament. My game continued to get exposed. I wasn't a good one-on-one -on -one player as I struggled to guard quick players and couldn't get a good shot off against their quickness. I felt my stock continue to drop. For some reason, I remained optimistic that it would still be drafted in the third round of the NBA draft. There was a false sense of security since I started at UNC for three years on some great teams. The day was June 19th, 1984. I was speaking at Campbell College, now Campbell University, their basketball camp. It was a, a large camp with about 700 campers there. The NBA draft was that day, but only the top talent was invited to attend the draft in New York City. Before I was to speak, I called the UNC basketball office several times using a payphone at the gym. 
Linda Woods, who was Coach Smith's longtime secretary, answered and I asked, any news? There was no news of me being drafted. I remember calling her at least three times as the draft moved through the first few rounds. Then it was time for me to address the campers. I was frazzled as I got up in front of the kids. My mind was racing about the draft. I finally got into the flow of teaching the young players about the game I loved since I was a fourth grader. Then suddenly I felt the tap on my shoulder. It was the director of the camp interrupting my talk. He whispered into my ear, sixth round Cleveland. My knees started to buckle. Tears started to sting my eyes. Six round Cleveland, I thought to myself, no one makes the NBA drafted that low and the Cleveland Cavaliers were the worst team in basketball. I did my best to compose myself and finish the lecture, but I was numb. After I was done, I drove back to my apartment in Chapel Hill. I thought about my future the whole ride home. What happened? Why doesn't the NBA think I'm good enough? To make matters worse, the next morning, my, my radio alarm clock went off. It was tuned to the local radio station. While still in bed, I heard the sports reporter listing the ACC players drafted by the NBA. He was going down the list and I heard UVA's Rick Carlisle, third round, Boston Celtics. I immediately started to cry in my bed. Rick and I had developed a good friendship that spring, meeting for workouts in Charlottesville and in Chapel Hill as we prepared for the draft. I would stay at his apartment and he would stay at mine. Third round, Boston Celtics was where I wanted to be drafted. I love Larry Bird and I felt my style of play would fit there. Instead, I was drafted in the sixth round by Cleveland. That summer, I ended up tweaking my back and missed rookie camp with the Cavs, but I was invited back for veterans camp. I remember World Be Free was there and how big and athletic everyone was. Even the players who weren't considered good players were good. Former UNC player George Carl was the coach and he ended up telling me that I wasn't going to make the team. I appreciated the fact that he drafted me, probably at the request of Coach Smith. I went into free fall emotionally. For 12 years, I loved basketball and loved me back. It was like a marriage. We had great times together. We laughed, we cried, we won, we lost. We traveled together, we grew together. We were synonymous. Matt Doherty was a basketball player. That was my identity and I liked it. It felt good. I was proud of that identity. All I ever wanted to be was a basketball player. Now I was being told I wasn't good enough. My basketball career was over. Yeah, so Matt, that, uh, that, that tells a story of a guy who's just invested his life into this game and then it, it just comes to an abrupt halt. And I know it was tough when you uh, emotionally at that time, you sort of picked yourself up. You went to Wall Street to make a buck. You hated that job. You came back to Charlotte, got a job at a search firm. You became a radio analyst uh, announcing Davison basketball. And then Davison, lo and behold, hires your high school basketball coach, Bob McKillop. He hires you, and you're back in the game. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why I wanted to. I must have really disliked basketball, but I was miserable on Wall Street and there was a void there. I was trying to get closer to basketball. I was trying to get closer. I was stalking basketball. <laughs> and, and, and then I started to do the radio. I moved to Charlotte and the guy who I worked for, Ed Sockwell, ran a Sockwell and Anderson search firm, God rest his soul. Ironically, it's Luke May's grandfather who played at North Carolina, Ed Sockwell. And um, he had an AAU team. So he asked me if I wanted the coach's eighth grade team. So I said, sure. Charles Waddell, who was a great player, athlete at North Carolina, was an assistant for me. Uh, and Jeff McGinnis, who ended up playing at North Carolina and played in the NBA and is a successful high school coach in the Charlotte area, was my point guard. And um, I just remember falling in love with everything about it, from the planning of practice 
to the picking the kids up, to dropping them off, to being with Charles as an assistant, to planning the road trips, to scouting, to the games. I loved it. And then Bob got the job at Davidson and fortunately hired me. And at that point, I never felt like I worked a day in my life. And, and I worked probably twice as many hours as I did selling bonds on Wall Street. So let, let me just, I, wanna, I know people are going to talk here about uh, your experience at, at Carolina. So just going to fast forward here a little bit. You go work for uh, Roy Williams at Kansas. So you then get the job at Notre Dame. And I, I have a little side light here because your mother in the book was ecstatic. She thought you should have been a priest, but I think she said to you the next best thing was being the head coach at Notre Dame, right? That's right. That's a true story. <laughs> true story. Yes. And so, and so, and so you know, you, you've got this great job in Notre Dame. Uh, you were raised, you know, Irish Catholic. You're, 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 you're not a priest, but you're the head coach of Notre Dame. Right. Um, and then you get the call, you know, um, and UNC's pulling out all the stops when, uh, you know, Guthrie's just leaving. And uh, Dean Smith's recruiting you, the master recruiter. Roy Williams, your trusted advisor, tells you he thinks you can do the job. But then Notre Dame offers you a significant contract extension and $12 million. Yeah. And, and, and so what does Dean Smith do? He has Michael Jordan call you and say, hey, we need you. We can't let this go outside the family. That's right. Um, yeah. I was going back and forth whether to stay at Notre Dame or not. Some people thought, you know, it was a done deal. I was going to North Carolina. No, I mean – my wife would joke with me. I'd come down like in, in, in a t-shirt and shorts. One morning it would be Notre Dame t-shirt and shorts. The next morning might be North Carolina t-shirt and shorts. And um, I really thought about staying, but when it came down to Michael Jordan calling me and, and saying that coach Smith might have to go outside the family if I don't take the job and hire uh, actually Rick Majerus. Uh, I didn't want that happening to our program. And I just felt like, okay, I got to take one for the team. You know, granted it was North Carolina, but you know, there, there was some trepidation uh, there. Um, I only been a head coach for one year. I love Notre Dame. Um, I love the players there. Um, we were going to be good. Yeah. We were going to be good. We had a good, 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 good players coming back and good players coming in. Yeah. So, so, we can't talk about this next uh, part of the conversation um, or, or part of your chapter in life without talking about the Carolina way and the Carolina family, because you're coming home now. There is this thing called the Carolina way. I don't know if it's like the secret fraternity handshake you, and you can't talk about it, but you talk about oh. it in the books. You might as well talk about it. There, no. There's the secret handshake. Uh, Landis. <laughs> and if I, if I showed you, I'd have to kill you. Okay. All right. Well, tell me the parts you can disclose here that, uh, and, and maybe in this answer, you can weave into it some of the things, uh, because you talk about some of the things you learned um, in retrospect that you might've done differently, but, but uh, the Carolina way is about family to some extent. And, and part of what got you in trouble as I'm reading your book really was you trying to stick to that mantra because you were trying to look after your assistants at Notre Dame, and yet that blinded you to some things when you came into Chapel Hill. Talk about that and the lesson you learned and, and tell us what that secret handshake is. Yeah. Well, no, I won't show you that. No, <laughs> no because otherwise it would get bloody. I okay, just, right. You know, I, I would hate for that to happen. You know, you got a lot, a lot of nice white furniture and, and shelves right. and books in the background. Okay. Um, the uh, – the one thing that Coach Smith really stressed was family and loyalty. And I felt, and, and this is something that's significant, but seems very small to people. They may not understand the significance of it. Coach Guthridge did not retire till the middle slash end of June. I didn't get, take the job at North Carolina till July 11th. And anybody that knows anything about college basketball understands that's the most important month of the year for every college program in the country, because that's the July recruiting period. That's when you have to be out evaluating talent, showing high school players your face, flashing 
your logo, your school logo. And, and so it was late and I could not take that job in good faith and leave my staff, you know, uncovered. There's no guarantee they'd have a job. So I felt that I needed to take them with me. I wanted to take them with me. And I asked, I asked Dick Bedore, I said, Dick, I said, I I'm gonna, I, I wanna take my staff with me. Is that okay? And if it's not, I'll stay at Notre Dame. Now Dick Bedore is the athletic director. So yeah, I got, he said, yes. So I said, okay, check. But looking back, I probably, you know, and, and I wanted Coach Smith to tell me, I wanted to hear from Coach Smith, you know, because everyone kept saying, you take that job, it's Coach Smith's program, he's going to want to run it through you. So I sat with Coach Smith and he said, it's your program, you run it see how you see fit. That's what I wanted to hear. And then the third thing was, my first year, we're going to be good. My second year, we're not. My third year, we're going to be rebuilding. And that's exactly what happened. We were number one in the country my first year. My second year, we were eight and 20. That's the year we lost to Davidson at home. My third year, we were rebuilding. We beat Kansas in the garden. Roy Williams' team, final 14. Sean May breaks his foot. We go 19 and 16. So everything played out. But I should have been savvier in dealing with Coach Smith, understanding, like I'm, I'm so practical. Like if you tell me something, I take it for fact. I'm not going to play games and try to read, you know, it was that passive aggressive. Did he really mean that? Did he, did he mean to show up later? Did he, did he really think it was a good book? Did he, I'm not going to, that's too much wasted energy. Did you like the book? If you say yes, you like the book. If you didn't like the book, tell me. I'm from New York. I'm okay with either one. Don't play games with me or they'll punch you in the face. <laughs> well, 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 Matt, you hit, you hit on a good point here. So you didn't retain Phil Ford. That got you in trouble. You started some redecorating. You moved some seats, passes around. You took down old photos. You put up new ones. You had year two, went eight and 20, worst season in UNC history. But then you bounced back, had a great recruiting class. Raymond Felton, Sean May, Rashid, uh, Rashid McCants, 19 wins but there were rumblings that the players weren't happy. And then, you know, even though you checked off those three things, you lose the position, um, you felt betrayed. Um, Dean Smith told you, you say this in the book, that if you'd have won 20 games, they couldn't fire you and you couldn't understand why he couldn't fight for you for one, one game, you won 19. Uh, they questioned your leadership in a press conference. You said, I believe, and this is a quote, I felt like I was falling backward off the Empire State Building with no safety net to catch me. Just two seasons earlier, you voted AP National Coach of the Year. And you said to yourself, how could the university you love turn on, turn on me? And you talk in the book, Matt, and this is the part, you know, that's really honest um, and the things that you've struggled with. You talk in the book about forgiveness. And you talk about needing to forgive yourself, but also needing to forgive others. How hard was that for you to do? It's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, you know, you, you, life is a test, you know, and you wonder why. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder, like, did God think I was getting too ahead of myself, too full of myself, too out over my skis and, you know, kind of, I jokingly say, slap me in the back of the head, said, oh, too much, too fast, slow down, young man. And, um, you know, God promises you hardship. He doesn't promise you a smooth path. And so we have to trust that. And I talk about trusting the closed door. You just don't have to slam it, God, right? Just close it. Don't, don't slam it. You know, just close it. But he slammed that door. But as I've gotten older, when I go, I've gone after opportunities and get them, it hurts your ego. It hurts your pride. But I've learned, I mean, I, I, about 
three years ago, four years ago, I interviewed for a job, didn't get it, should have gotten it, thought I got it, I was probably more than qualified, mid-major, low-major job in the state of North Carolina. And as soon as I got the message, the text message from the AD, I got on my knees and, and prayed to God, thank you for closing the door. You know, it's called faith. We're not going to know. I don't believe we're going to know why things happen to us until we're in heaven. And then maybe we get the plan revealed to us. And, you know, it's like, oh, okay, that made sense. I wish you would have told me why I was going on, <laughs> but okay, I got it. So uh, it's a real test. And I think that that's why we deal with hardship because it tests our faith and it, it, it hopefully brings us closer to God. Sometimes it doesn't. Well, Matt, one of the brave things you did, I mean, you, you recruited this class of uh, NBA players who, you know, shortly after you're fired, wins the national championship under another coach. Um, you carry that with you for years. Uh, you want to talk to Dean Smith about it. You want to talk to Roy Williams about it. Finally, you do. There's a touching scene in the book where you go, Dean Smith is not able to talk at that point, but but Roy welcomes you into his office. And and as you get in there, you 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 really have a hard time, you know, just opening up. But that that must have taken a great deal of courage just to and, and compassion on his part as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you really have to have crucial conversations. And 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 you know, as you get older, you get better at them. And it was important for me to have a discussion with Coach Smith and Coach Williams. There were several times where I picked up the phone to Coach Smith and put it down. I, I didn't have the courage to do it. And then by the time I did, it was too late due to his health. But uh, Coach Williams, Roy met with me and he was great. He listened, you know, and you're not going to always like a friend of mine said, OK, now you could go in there, but don't expect to hear what you want to hear. Right. Don't expect something magical to happen. But I felt it was important that I get it out because anger turned inward leads to depression. And I was depressed. I dealt with depression for a long time. I just put on a good mask. And so I get in there and I'm saying to myself, okay, be tough, be tough, be tough, be a man, be a man. And I, you know, I'm emotional family. Our families cry when a Hallmark card <laughs> commercial comes on the TV. And so uh, I get in there and I sit down and I'm in the same office that I occupied six years earlier is kind of surreal. And as soon as I sat, sat down and started to talk, I started crying, sobbing for that matter, embarrassed, but it was just pouring out of my soul. And I talked and I just told them how I felt. See, people can't and shouldn't argue with how you feel. They can maybe argue about your thinking, why you think a certain way, but not how you feel. So I just wanted to tell him how I felt about all that went on. And I walked out of there, I felt like 600 pounds were lifted off my shoulders, Landis, and I had the best night's sleep I had in six years. That's great. And, and you know, also, you've written this book and you're sitting down to write and put all these thoughts on the page. Uh, and it's one thing to do it in the privacy of your own study, your office, but then you're going to put it out into the world. Was there any secret uh, or any discussion? It might have been this one that that you were just a little bit concerned about putting out to the world. Um, and, and did you think hard about that before you did it? And and having done it, how how, how do you feel now? Yeah, uh, it's great questions. Um, as I talk in the book, you need to have truth tellers in your life. And two of my truth tellers, and, and you need to have a board of directors, people you can go to for advice, to tell you the truth. Uh, one was John Black in Charlotte, who helped me 
as a friend get on the leadership journey and the other is Scott Stankavich who played football at North Carolina when I was there. And John, uh, Scott wrote a book using Larry Carpenter who's the publisher uh, of my book. Uh, and oh, by the way, I'd like to say hello to Cindy Byrne who's our, my, my, uh, in charge of PR. I call her fire because she is always on fire. She's awesome. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'd like to thank my family, by the way, my wife, Kelly, my son, Tucker, my daughter, Hattie. Um, and I mentioned my sister, Nan, and my uncle Dennis is on the line too. So um, the, the, um, I, the last thing you want to do, and you've written books, I've not. But, you know, it's it's easy to- You've retract. written a book. We're, we're here talking about your book. No, no, but I mean, I'm saying before this. <laughs> before, before this, yeah, yeah before yeah. this, yeah. You know, that's why it's, you know, <laughs> you can always take back something you said. That, that doesn't live internally unless it's recorded. You know, an email, a text message, that's forever. A book is forever. So you don't want to make a mistake. And so I asked Scott Stankavich and John Black to read it for me and give me honest feedback. And they did. And there was a part in there where I probably got a little too emotional. And John said, you know, you'd probably be better served taking that out. Mm. Like, okay. So I took it out. Um, but for the most part, you know, I just needed to, to clean things up and try to make it flow better. It's not easy writing a book. You know, I wrote the book. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have a publisher and somebody edited it, but I wrote the book and it takes a lot of work. Yeah. So uh, as we're finishing up here, um, we might get a few questions from the audience here, but uh, talking about leadership for a minute, because you have really um, taken these difficult circumstances in your life and uh, like a good competitor, uh, you have gotten back up and gotten out there. And you have this, uh, I've got a couple of questions here. You have these core values, uh, respect, trust, commitment, and positivity. Why did you pick those four? Well, a couple of things. I think um, I didn't have core values in my organization until after I went on my leadership journey. And I'm, I, I like to study. Um, I like to steal things uh, from other <laughs> successful people. That's what coaches do. We see a play we like, we take it. I got to know Matthew Karras, who's a lieutenant colonel in the Army. And uh, he's mentioned in the book. Um, and he talked about core values to me. And, and um, so I wanted to incorporate that in my next coaching stop. And I think... When I look at organizations, they have these big, elaborate core values and mission statements, but nobody in the organization can remember them. <laughs> so core values, in my opinion, should be three to four values in total, because it's the same reason why phone numbers are three and four digits long. You can remember three and four digits, but you can't remember seven, right? If a phone number was seven digits long, you couldn't remember it, but you can remember three and four. So that's why core values should be three or four things. And I think respect is the most important one, Landis, because every human being wants to feel respected. They don't necessarily need to feel your love. They don't have to be liked by you, but they better feel respected. I think that to the core is the most important thing. And that's why we have so much problems in our country today. It's a respect thing. And then if you have respect, you can move to trust. Because if you don't have trust in a, in a relationship, a working relationship, player to coach, player to player, you're not going to be successful. And then the commitment, same thing. You better be committed to doing your job each and every day the best you can do. And then I added the positivity last year because I don't want to be around energy suckers. There are two kinds of players. 
There's energy givers and energy suckers. And I don't want to be around moody people. I want to be around people that bring energy, even when things are getting tough. They have to have a sense of optimism. There's a great book that I'm reading right now, um, Shackleton's Way, Ernest Shackleton, the, the explorer. I think another book along is Endurance, same, same topic. And his biggest thing people said about his leadership when they were shipwrecked was he had optimism. And he looked for that in the people he brought onto his team. Yeah, and, and Matt, one of the nice things you do in this book uh, toward the end when you're talking about leadership, you take 10, 15 different uh, principles of leadership and you, and you break them down. I picked out two to finish up here with. You focused on failure and you focused on pivoting. And you talk about failure uh, in this way. You say you should embrace failure. You should celebrate failure. And you said it sounds crazy but you should make failure your friend. And, I, and I'm having to think that you're drawing this, these conclusions from your own personal experience. Well, the thing is, um, you can't be afraid to fail. Like that's no way to perform as an athlete, as a business person. Like if you're afraid to make a mistake, shame on your coach. You know, and, and Jimmy Dillon's list, listening right now, if he's still on the line, and he was daring. Like Jimmy wasn't afraid to make a mistake. And that's what made him so good. Um, any player that played to make him, you know, at a fear of failure was so tight, they couldn't make a shot. And that's part of the coach's job is to kind of get a feel of the personnel and give that player confidence and let them know, hey, it's okay. Matt Carroll, who was a player from for with Jimmy you know, at Notre Dame, we're playing, he's a freshman, we're playing at UConn, UConn's top five in the country, our first Big East game. Matt Carroll goes, he's a good shooter, played for the Hornets, goes 0 for 5 in the first half. I come in, I look at the stat sheet, and one of the first things I do, I say, Matty, you're 0 for 5 in the first half. You're the best shooter in this freaking gym. When you're open, knock it down. He went five for five in the second half, scored 10 points, and we beat UConn at UConn. Hmm. You can't be afraid. You can't yeah. be afraid to fail. So, you know, you got to celebrate it in a way, you know, because if you have the right attitude, Nelson Mandela, and I use this quote, he talks about, I never lose. I either win or I learn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Thomas Edison says, hey, yeah, I, I, that's just, I failed 10,000 times. That's just 10,000 ways I learned not to do it. So it's all about perspective. The second concept was pivoting. Uh, it, it's got the basketball connotation to it, but it's also, as you talk about it, uh, something you need to have uh, in your career, in the workplace. As you said, you need to be prepared to pivot when that new job comes along or when you're forced into that situation where you have to take another path like you did after you lost the job at Carolina. So you've pivoted a lot in your career. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've gotta... worn out my shoes, Landis. <laughs> I've pivoted so much. You, you've pivoted a lot. And, and I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, do you think the journey would have been as interesting for you had you not had to pivot so much? <laughs> Oh, gosh, no, but I, I might have darker hair. <laughs> you know, uh, Brian Moran's on the line, too. Brian's uh, become a very good friend, um, former publisher, and uh, just an all-around good guy, even though he went to Chaminade High School, where Bob McKillop went. I, uh, and he has a great quote. He talked about Mother Teresa and... Um, you know, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. And Mother Teresa said, I just wish he wouldn't trust me so much. <laughs> you know, and and so, um, yeah, you know, I look at the experiences I had 
and they've made me who I am today. I think I've searched after I got out of coaching for that perfect opportunity. And I think I have it now. I'm an executive coach with Vistage. I, I teach CEOs. I have a team of CEOs. I'm a coach. I just don't coach basketball. And now I got to share this book. I'm an author. Matter of fact, I'm qualified to say I'm a best-selling author because I'm top 10 in two of uh, Amazon's categories. That's awesome. You're sell selling like hotcakes. First, you got to get them. You got to get them at Park Road Books while you have a chance. And uh, Matt, I'm looking at the chat here. There are all kinds of people that want you to prognosticate about things all Carolina basketball, like who's going to be the next coach and, you know, what, what's their record going to be and so forth. Uh, I don't know that we have time for all that. Um, I would like to uh, ask you to, to just reflect a bit. I, I sometimes ask this of authors. I ask them this in the, in the way of a writing question. Um, I'm going to ask it to you in the way of a life question. And that is, um, if, you, if you could tell your younger coaching self something of value it just you know one thing that uh you've learned now through all this experience you're still a coach but if you could tell that young coach something valuable that you think would have helped that young coach that had he known it uh maybe things would have been a little you know not quite as difficult what, what would it be um the art of coaching is more important than the science of coaching. And what I mean by that is I loved the X's and the O's, the planning of practice, the strategy. I love that. And then I was, I'm a ENTJ in the Myers-Briggs assessment. Only 2% of the population are ENTJs. Sounds pretty cool. Like I'm a leader. <laughs> I touch on this in the book. But that means 98% of the population don't think like I think. I didn't need a lot of patting on the back. I didn't need a lot of, you know, just give me the assignment and I'm going to go out and do my job. But 98% of the population aren't like that. So I think understanding the emotional intelligence part, that was the aha moment when I went on the leadership journey and I took classes at the Darden School and at Wharton in Philadelphia, where I'm like, oh my gosh, I never heard of emotional intelligence until 2003. And if I would have taken these leadership courses before I became a head coach, I might still be the head coach at North Carolina. Leadership is a learned behavior. And that was the most exciting thing I read in that class in Philadelphia. So you, so I, I kind of picked up in the book that you thought that all basketball coaches should be required to attend some kind of leadership training course. And, and maybe if you'd have had that, as you said, um, it would have helped you a little bit to understand those little nuances that in the big scheme of things probably weren't as blown up as people made them to be no no you know and then and then it just gets exasperated by being at uh, north carolina yeah, yeah i was praised for a lot of the things i did at notre dame that i brought to north carolina that i wasn't praised for yeah well matt i want to look I, I, we're, we're running up on our hour here um i, I want to thank you first of all for your uh honesty to, to put this on paper for telling your story because too often people don't tell their story you've told it you've been courageous about it you've now got it out there in book form you're a, like you're a top 10 amazon seller that's awesome uh, and uh, also because you're telling your story um people who read it can connect and and maybe they might say you know yeah okay i've had a situation like that too and and so to end this what do you hope people take away from your book well it's great you bring that up because the intention was to teach people <clears throat> lessons that I learned to help them avoid the landmines I stepped on as a leader. However, one of the byproducts, the, 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 
the, the, the, you know, byproducts of the book, unintended consequences of the book, I've gotten several people, some I knew, some I didn't know, thanking me for sharing because they have gone through a situation where they felt betrayed or by a, by a company or a school or, and they, they were dealing with depression, anger, and they didn't know how to deal with it. And I think sometimes we think we're the only one. And so when they heard, read my book or heard me on a podcast talking about my book, it helped them. It helped them heal. I had no idea the book would have that kind of impact. And that's probably more important than teaching them anything about leadership. Yeah, well, the, you know, the best books, I think, are those that, uh, you know, the reader can uh, relate to. Uh, they can see some of their own story, you know, and what's written there. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, Matt, not everybody is perfect, right? The only person that was perfect <laughs> died on the cross. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so with, with that in mind, um, I guess if Megan's out there, I, I can see the Park Road Books uh, sign on, on the on the screen. There she is. She's back. back. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me just uh, let me do this. Uh, I want to say... Uh, Thank you to Park Road Books for letting Charlotte Readers Podcast come on. And for anybody who's listening, if uh, if you hadn't listened to our podcast yet, we do this kind of thing on the podcast. We interview authors of nonfiction, fiction. Um, we have New York Times bestsellers. We also have local and regional authors. So uh, you can check it out at charlottereaderspodcast.com or wherever you like to listen to your podcast. wanted to thank you for that and put that plug in. Matt, I want to thank you again uh, for uh doing this so i could come on and talk to you about it it was, it was uh, really landis you're per perfect host thank you for doing your research yeah. megan thanks to you and park road books to to putting this event on for me and the book and uh i look forward to seeing you on saturday when i come in at 10 o'clock to sign hopefully a bunch that have been sold yes you will there are already a bunch that have been sold so i can't wait for there to be more Everybody Good. who's attending, come get one or call us and we'll put one on hold for you and we get them signed and get them to you all sorts of ways. It, it's, a, it's a great book, whether you're, uh, whether you ever liked uh, the bouncing ball or not, you're going to get something out of this story because it's, while it is a story about basketball, I think more than that, it's a story about life. Yeah. Amen. Thanks for those who uh, zoomed in to uh, watch and listen. I uh, appreciate that, especially family and friends. Thank you so much. Okay, well, Thanks, I, think that, I think that wraps it up. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope you have a great night and thank you, Matt and Landis. We really appreciate it here at Park Road Books. Get your signed copies from us and let's all go out and buy Rebound. There we go, <laughs> all right. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.